Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Mic'd Up Sports, the show that goes in depth with the people who build our sports community. And joining me is someone who did a lot of that at Eden Prairie, both on the girls volleyball team and within the student body. Uh, you will see here pick up kills, blocks, and everything in between next fall at Bradley University, Kendall Minta a bronze medalist, if I'm correct, in last year's state volleyball tournament and getting some track experience as well. So a two sport <laughs> athlete, I guess you can claim that before sure. speeding up at Bradley, but all joking aside, she was a yeah, tremendous athlete and I do not want to mess with her because if I got on the receiving end of one of her spikes, uh, I don't think I'd have a face left. <laughs> but Kendall, thanks for joining us and now that you're a graduate, your high school career is finished, you're getting ready to make that transition. What do you remember most fondly about your time as a youth athlete representing Eden Prairie? Um, I probably say just like the relationships and the team camaraderie that we had. Um, I think just starting, I started playing high school volleyball like as an eighth grader and just watching the program grow and progress. And even from like when I was on JV as a freshman, like we always like worked really hard and we played really well as a team. And it was like those relationships. And I think um, even though we might not have been the, one of the most talented, I think we were obviously one of the most talented teams in the state, but like some of those games that we weren't supposed to win per se, like skill wise, I think us playing together as a team really helped and we trust each other and we never gave up. Like I will never forget the sections game where we were down in the, I think it was the third set we were down 24 like 19 or something and we came back and won that set so I think just like believing in each other and the team aspect that we always had I will never forget that of course I was there to cover that game so I remember it although in my case Kendall I remember it for a slightly different reason and I'm actually I'm looking this up yeah I do remember you had to come from behind twice but I just remember Eden Prairie winning it because Jaska crossed the center line and I'm calling it and I'm thinking to myself, uh, what do I do here? So <laughs> fortunately it helped that the student section just mobbed you after the point was called. And I just let the pictures tell the story because in my head, I'm like, I've prepared for a lot of championship calls, but nothing like this where the match is decided on a center line violation. And I'm like, uh, okay, I guess that's it. Yeah. So, but but again, it helps. Had you not had a student section and and wall to wall fan section filled with fans, I might have been in, in a more awkward position. But thankfully, <laughs> they took care of things for me, and so I just let it things play out before I jumped in. And I just remember I said somewhere in that pile is Kendall Minta, who <laughs> was responsible for all of this. But I do remember, yeah, you were down. I think twenty sixteen. And then it was back and forth the rest of the way. No, that was a fun time. I know Eden Prairie and Chaska have quite the rivalry being in the same section. But as I understand it, Kendall, you originally didn't grow up here. You came to us, I can't remember exactly, but you're not from here originally. Uh, what led you here and how quickly did you acclimate to Eden Prairie in the Twin Cities area? Yeah, so I moved from St. Louis, Missouri when we were, um, when I was going into seventh grade. Um, we came here because my mom's job, which she actually has a different job now, but it was originally for her first, her job here. And then, so I started um, at CMS, the middle school in Eden Prairie in seventh grade, which was nice because that's like when Eden Prairie started. Well, now they start in sixth grade, but when I came to middle school, it was like the first year of middle school. So all the elementary schools were coming together, which made it a lot easier to like, not be the new kid per se because everyone hadn't really met each other which was nice and then obviously like I played sports so playing volleyball I like played travel fall my seventh grade year which was fun and I got to like meet some of the girls and then I think like three of the girls that were ended up being on our like state varsity team were like on that little fall team in seventh grade so like that was a great way to meet people I met some of my friends there and then obviously like coming into a new school, I think everyone was pretty welcoming. I met a lot of new people. Um, I think I'm pretty good at like talking to new people. Like, I think I'm excited for that in college too, to just meet a bunch of new people. So I think it wasn't super hard for me, um, but it was also, it also helped that it was like a new stage for kind of everyone. 
So you weren't just the new kid. Everyone yeah. was the new kid yeah. when you came in. Uh, you mentioned having a volleyball background. When did you start picking up volleyball? And did you play any other sports when you were little as you were making your way through? Um, so I started playing on like a rec team in St. Louis in third grade. But I'd always kind of just like played around the house. Like my aunt played volleyball in college. And then my mom like played club volleyball in college and high school. So all my family was like, oh my gosh, you want me to play volleyball? Like, you know, it was kind of like a thing when I was little. But um, in St. Louis, they didn't start having teams at all until third grade. Unlike here, I think you can start in like kindergarten or something. So I like started there and then I did like the little camps. And then I started playing club in sixth grade. Um, when I was little, I played like soccer. I never played basketball, shockingly. I, they all tried to convince, when in St. Louis, they didn't have a team for like my age group. So all the way through sixth grade, I'd like never played. And then I moved here and everyone was like, please play basketball. Like all the coaches tried to get me and recruit me. And I was like, sorry, like I'm already playing volleyball. Like I probably could have tried it. Like I probably would have liked it, but I just never did. So. Of course, I have to ask you this, Kendall, because <laughs> of our mutual connections. How hard did your best friend, your compadre, Nia, try to convince you to join her on the basketball team? I she never really did, honestly. I think it was more like the coaches. Like I was like, I like I kind of thought it was like volleyball is like my thing. Like I know I want to keep doing this, like I want to play it in college. And she's kind of like, okay, like that's your thing, this is my thing. Which honestly and long term, it's probably good that we have separate sports because we're so close. But you know. <laughs> well, I think the two of you would have gotten along just fine. <laughs> and it does lead me to another question because I understand there is a dispute of sorts so when it comes to blocking <laughs> Nia claims she taught you how to block I, you refuted this last winter when Nia had a couple of big blocks against Lakeville North and of course word got out with one of the photographers got a snapshot of it so uh, who was responsible for teaching you how to block Kendall I think um volleyball Tom had block and then I taught her to block you know it's just like those like those two handed blocks, like who in basketball, like two hand blocks like that, like it's got to be for me. Obviously, she learned from me. She'll never admit it, but she for sure they did. <laughs> Are there any other disputes that the two of you have, have yet to settle in this friendship of yours? <laughs> oh, gosh, I'm sure there are, but not that I can think of right now. <laughs> and if you haven't picked up on this, we're all having fun here because I actually got to meet you through Nia when I covered some EP volleyball this past fall and your parents know each other quite well. I think Nia's mother told me the story that sometimes teachers or others who weren't familiar would get the two of you mixed up in the sense that they thought you were related because of like, <laughs> oh, here's two tall athletic girls in our class. And uh, do you recall the first meeting the two of you had and what led you to connect as tightly as you have? It's actually kind of a funny story. We were in the same classes, like in seventh and eighth grade, but we never really talked. Like we're, I was like, man, like, but my mom was like, kind of like, I met this girl actually like through Zoe. I don't know if you know her Hardwick. She played at Minnetonka a few years back. Mm -hmm. um, so they were at her game and my mom went to that game too. And they like met the, our parents met and they're like, oh my gosh, like, we have to get you guys to hang out. And we we're like, man, like whatever, like I saw her going on. I was like, man, like, okay, whatever, fine. So we like hung out like at my house for the first time. They like forced us to hang out. And we always like joke, like our parents like forced us to be friends. And it's like great that they did because now we're really close. <laughs> okay, so if your parents forced you to be friends, uh, how did you, how did that evolve from being forced into this friendship to a natural one? Because I, I would see you too well in volleyball. I think Nia would have held her own with the way she can block. I'm, I'm <laughs> you know, kind of like how the coaches tried to get you into basketball. I'm going, I think Nia missed out. I know she had already committed to Minnesota by that point, but I'm thinking the two of you up front together. Yeah. I think it would have been crazy. I think, I don't know. I think we obviously like started talking more and we, like I said, we had classes together. So I think we started naturally kind of becoming more friends and then, obviously we started hanging out outside and we had, we realized we had a lot more in common than we thought as like seventh graders that were like, well, eh, you don't need to hang out. Like who knows that girl over there? Like she's, so I think once we like, and we're both like elite athletes, like there aren't a lot of us obviously at our school and in the community. So we started hanging out and we found out we had a lot in common and naturally just kind of progressed. And then, yeah, I don't know. Now we're really close. So. <laughs> 
I never would have guessed <laughs> if you hadn't said something. No, I, I tease, of course. It, it's fun. I, I, one reason I cover sports is I get to meet a lot of people, and I'm glad I had the chance to meet you, and I have needed to thank or blame for that. I haven't decided which yet. Uh, but what were, what were some of those common threads? You mentioned the two of you had a lot in common. I mean, what was one of those commonalities that linked the two of you up? Um, I would say, I think obviously, like I said, like sports, like that's obviously a big one. We both wanted to play like college sports at a high level. And then also like in the community, like we both have a really big passion for like social justice issues. So we found ourselves in a lot of the same clubs. So at the beginning, like freshman year, there's a club called Day Debris Real that we're both in. Um, that's like an anti-racist organization. So we both were in that. So we're like seeing each other at like sports and then we're like also at that. And so we realized like we had a lot of similar passions and then also, um, just like classes, we ended up taking a lot of the same, like, like AP government, like that's a lot about racial injustice and just learning about like how the government works. And I think we're both political science majors. So like, that's something like another similarity that we both had. So we just had a lot of similar passions and like ways we see the world. Um, so I think that just like helped us bond, I guess. Well, and alluding to a moment ago in this conversation, your parents, again, shared the story about the two of you having to navigate the, this environment where people think you're related because you know, they see, oh, two tall black girls in the same class, they just have to be. And obviously, it, things are a little more complex than that. But how did you navigate growing up? I imagine you were one of the taller members in your class. Well, and I guess you still are being 6'3". How have you handled that and how have you embraced that identity over the years? I feel like, um, well, since my parents are both tall, they've always just kind of instilled in me, like, you're tall, like, it's beautiful. Um, also, like, being Black, like, you're going to stand out and you're going to look different, but, like, there's nothing wrong with that and you don't have to try to be like everyone else and fit in. So I think I've always just kind of embraced that. Um, there's, like, random books that you'll read when you're, that my parents, like, read to me when I was a little bit, like, oh, you're tall or, oh, you're Black and, like, all those things are beautiful. Like, don't try to be like, put that away and like try to embrace that. And then also like being in sports, I feel like my whole life, once you like see that being tall is an advantage, you're kind of like, okay, well, like maybe in the classroom, I'm towering over all my teammates, but like on a volleyball court, I'm not like, I'm not tall in volleyball. Like I'm tall, but I'm not tall for a volleyball player, you know? So it's like seeing that and also just like wanting to be the best version of myself and like embracing that I feel like has been like as an athlete really helpful. And on that note, and this is something I ask uh, a lot of my podcasts when I have taller athletes on in the event that a younger viewer or listener might tune in, perhaps someone that wants to follow your footsteps at Eden Prairie in volleyball or in political science or whatever field they wish to pursue. The common refrain I would hear a lot from athletes like yourself who are six feet plus are finding clothes and shoes that fit you. What has that process been like in that aspect? Yeah, it's hard. Um, I'd say like online stores are a big hit, especially for shoes. Like also I think men's shoes have been, are like a lot more popular now. So I get a lot of like for like sneakers and like other cool tennis shoes like Jordans and just other like popular shoes. You can get the men's style and they're still like very trendy. But in terms of like clothes, I get a lot of stuff online or even like dress shoes. Like I had to find heels for this conference I went to this past weekend and you have to like look all over the internet to find a pair of heels that are in my size. So that's kind of frustrating, but it's possible. Um, I'm also just a big like athletic wearer. So like I wear a lot of sweatshirts and those companies usually do a good job at making clothes for tall people because athletes are usually longer and taller. But also if you just like look up tall clothing brands, you usually can find some good ones. Sounds like the you internet, have a, oh, yeah. the internet. The internet. I was going to say, it sounds like you have a story within a story. I mean, you're telling me <laughs> this journey just to find heels for this leadership conference that you were a part Absolutely. of. In St. <laughs> I hope it didn't take as long to find that as the whole conference itself, but <laughs> it, it, like uh, that, that if you ever decide to write an autobiography, I think you've got some <laughs> chapters, Kendall. Uh, I, I cannot say I've had the same experience. Uh, so I'll have to take your word for it, but that's okay. Uh, 
So as you made your way to the sport of volleyball, you played in traveling club leagues up until seventh grade, and then you started making your way through you know, the varsity, eventually making your way to varsity, of course. But you know, I have a lot of basketball athletes on, so there's a lot of common knowledge there. But in volleyball or elsewhere, who are the people you looked up to? And I asked that because volleyball it's growing in popularity, but it doesn't have that national or international appeal like basketball, soccer, uh, football here, some of the other sports. Uh, who are the people you looked up to as you were developing in the world of volleyball? Um, I think, well, volleyball obviously is still growing a lot, but some of like the local people that obviously like Sarah Wilhite, like grew up Indian Prairie. So watching her play at like Minnesota and then going on to like now play pro and she's like was an Olympic alternate. So that's really cool. Um, also like this, these past two years, Jordan Thompson from Edina has been doing well, really well. And she was like on the Olympic team and did really well there. Um, I think, I think a lot of it was like, I watched a lot of like Minnesota college volleyball when like I was, and then before that, when I lived in Missouri, we used to watch a lot of Mizzou. I can't like name a lot of the players then, but I remember just like watching them and like wanting to be like them and like seeing them play. I think I went to a camp I'm um, just seeing how they've played and then also like how the sport has grown has been really cool because a lot of players are advocating for more they want a pro league here in the U.S. because obviously like if you want to play pro volleyball you have to go overseas so they started like an AU sports I think is what it's called they started like a little mm -hmm. pro league here where they like have the teams every week and they like switch teams every week but I think it'd also be really cool if that could grow or even if they could have like a different league that's like where set teams like it'd be really cool to like play here, like the WNBA and not have to like go overseas, but I know they go overseas too. So maybe it's just a women's sports like issue that more people need to work on funding sports in the U S. And athletes unlimited is the uh, league you're thinking of. And to your point, Kendall, it took a long time for the men's leagues to get to where they are. The NBA needed about 30 years before it turned into a national and then later international phenomenon. Uh, Major League Baseball, the NFL, they were in similar positions. There was a time when these athletes had to take on other jobs to supplement themselves. And the WNBA in a similar position, they're taking steps forward. And I'm hopeful that we see more investment, more attention in the sport of volleyball, because I look at some of the viewership from other stations for high school girls volleyball games. One station, CCX, has several of them with over a million views on their YouTube page, which mm -hmm. I find astounding. Mm -hmm. And I know it, it's a popular sport in terms of participation, So I'm thinking getting more penetration out there. The Athletes Unlimited League, I think, is a step to create more of that interest locally so that prospects like yourself, if you decide to go pro, don't have to go overseas. Uh, I met a few coaches in my volleyball coverage who went that route, and they loved it, getting a chance to see the world. But I think there's something to be said about finding an opportunity here so you can – uh, play in front of the people who got you there. So we'll see what happens. Uh, yeah. And you've got a few years at Bradley to fine tune your game. So I I'm not going to rule anything out. I'm just going to let it glide, as they say, mm -hmm. and cheer you on no matter what happens, along with all the other athletes who I've met. <laughs> as you were making your way through, when did you sense that this talent, this interest in volleyball could get you places? Um, I think when I first like started playing club, so sixth, seventh grade, well, I started playing in sixth, but in like seventh grade when I moved here, um, I like saw how big the sport was. And when I saw like older girls playing, like I was 13 when we moved here. So going to watch the tournaments, I would always like tell my mom, like, I want to stay, like watch the 17s or the 16s and 18s play because it just was so much faster and so much harder. And I was like, if I can like be that in three years, like. I sign me up like I would love to hit that hard and block like that and even like now looking back at like 15s being like oh my gosh look how far I've come from there I think just no and like the coaches that believed in me then and were like kind of like you could be that one day I think I was like I definitely want to continue because watching volleyball is so cool and like seeing how cool this sport is I just like fell in love with it when I first 
start a pine club and saw how cool it could really be. Do you remember when you got your first offer, how many offers you ended up receiving and what was that process like when college coaches and scouts considered you valuable enough to recruit? Um, so for me, I got my first offer. So for volleyball, it was really weird because um, I was talking to some schools like freshman year and then they, the NCAA changed the rules in the middle of, I think it was the middle of that year. And they said, you can't start, there's going to be a certain date where you can't talk to coaches at all until the end of your sophomore year. So June 15th of after your sophomore year. So like all that right now, all the 2024s can talk to coaches like as of like a week ago. And so it was, the, they changed that rule in the middle of my freshman year. So I was talking to some coaches, not to, you could call, you could talk to them and call them and then they could email your recruiter and then they could forward it, but you couldn't directly, it was like weird. I don't know, but you could still talk to them. Right. So they could still offer you and you could still commit. So a lot of girls in my class committed like seventh, eighth, ninth grade. So I was talking to some schools then, and I probably went have been on track to like get an offer from them, but then the communication like cut off until for another year and a half. And then, so I could like talk to coaches. I got like maybe one or two offers at the beginning of when we could talk to them. And then also then there was COVID. So then a lot of coaches were like, well, we haven't seen you play in person. We want to see you play in person. And then it just kind of kept getting, and then the dead period kept going longer and longer. So they never got to see me play in person. So I think personally, like if my recruiting journey would have been normal, it would have been a lot more. So I didn't have a ton of offers, but of the ones I got, like they're very valuable. And I got to go visit all the schools um, and talk to some really cool coaches. And I think even the ones I like, there were a couple of schools that like offered walk-ons because with the fifth year, like some schools were like, sorry, we just don't have the money. Um, but it was really cool. And it was a really fun experience. I think it was really frustrating because of the random cutoff. Like I feel like our class kind of got screwed over, especially with the COVID thing. And like, it kept getting pushed back and they were like, sorry, we've never seen you play in person. Like we love your video, but we can't see you. Um, but other than that, I think it was pretty good. And I think when I committed, I committed to Bradley my, after my junior, the end of like my 17th year and like going into my senior high school season. And when I like met the coaches there, which aren't there anymore, but those coaches and like the team and the fit in the school, I like loved it and fell in love. And I was like, I know this is where I want to like keep playing. So it worked out, I'd say. Well, you answered my next question. What led you to Bradley? <laughs> now you really have me tongue tied. What do I go from here? <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. So before you got to Bradley, of course, uh, you were able to put a, a solid resume together at Eden Prairie. And I think the, the COVID year threw everyone off track. We're still navigating the extra year that a lot of athletes received as a result of it. But over time, how did you think you evolved, you progressed as an athlete playing with Eden Prairie Volleyball? I think I've improved tremendously. Like, I can't even imagine. Like I, like I said, I started playing in eighth grade, like on the 10th grade team. So obviously from 10th grade volleyball to varsity volleyball, like being a state level competing, competing team, like it's leaps and browns, light and day difference. Um, I think the coaches have all been really supportive and I obviously have evolved a lot like as a player and I've learned a lot. I've played with a lot of different people. That's what I think is cool about high school is like you get to play with all these different grades. So people that graduated like three years ago and then I got to play with some people that like are still have like two, three more years of high school. So I think it's really cool. And then obviously club volleyball, um, I also think is a big part. Like I played at one club for four years and then um, my club that I was just at for vital the past two years and I think those coaches have all really helped me improved as an athlete too like that I think club volleyball is like where you see the most strides just because it's a much longer season than high school and then you get to like apply it all during high school season so I think overall it's been a very leaps and bounds of skill level and even athleticism I've just gotten a lot more thanks to like all my coaches it's and progress a lot. <laughs> and I only got to see a glimpse of that because that COVID year I sat out because of all the protocols and it wasn't uh, me complaining. It was just, it was so complicated to 
get in there and every school had a different interpretation of it. So uh, I waited until we got the all clear to return and it worked out. I had, again had the chance to meet you and a few of the other Eden Prairie volleyball athletes. But like you said, it's a short season at the high school level and you get a few regular season matches and then a lot of weekend invitational tournaments. So you don't get a lot of opportunities to watch teams compared to a sport like hockey or basketball where it's about three months long and you have a chance to see players and teams make adjustments. Uh, it, it's a real quick season. I think volleyball is about eight weeks, so a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And the invitational tournaments are best of three. So there, there's a lot to work around. I'm sure you're used to it at this stage, but what are some of the mm -hmm. challenges that come with a season where you have two months, but it's a mix of your traditional matches and then those weekend invitationals? Um, I would say, I feel like the tournaments aren't as hard because for club volleyball, like we play two out of three. So obviously like sometimes it's harder because like some games you could, in a five set match, you could lose the first two sets and then come back and win. And obviously like in a two out of three, you can't do that. But I think sometimes it's nice to like have a tournament where you get to play back to back because you can see yourself like improve. Like for example, this year we played in the Apple Valley Invitational and I feel like our team like improved so much and just like, of couple games because it's nice to like see different opponents um it it, it does kind of suck how short this season is like it'd be fun if it was longer but we I mean I guess that's like what it's always been so you don't really know anything different and then also like preseason I feel like since it's a fall sport you get more of that like summer training so you go into the season more prepared than maybe like a sport that doesn't have as much like a preseason because we can practice all day in the summer and then like train and then right into the games which is fun I liked it I'd say you found a way to make it work. Yeah. <laughs> How do you think you've developed as far as your profile? Because in the games I saw you play this year, even if you're not the tallest for volleyball standards, I remember seeing you and a lot of taller players, usually On they're stationed up side. front. Some can handle it multiple positions so that they can rotate to the back row and, and still contribute. But anytime you had a chance to go up front, uh, you were up there. And uh, I think I saw you play a couple of times, but both times uh, you left your mark, whether it was that win against Jefferson or the section final where you had a pretty big role in that third set victory. So what do you think goes into your skill set and how you've excelled when it comes to those power hits that you deliver, the blocking. You made yourself a tough foe to get around when defenders had to deal with you in the front row. Um, I think just a ton of practice. Like I, one of the goals I set for myself at the beginning of the season was to like be a defensive powerhouse person, like and not let a lot of balls cross the net. Um, I wanted to be like a strong blocker. I think I. Was like I want to be a menace blocker at the net every ball so like as little balls cross that come by me as possible so I think really honing in on blocking I did a lot of like private lessons or in practice just like focusing on like my technique and trying to perfect obviously not perfect but like get better at that um so that I can be the best blocker that I can be because I think it's so fun to get like a stuff block and because I don't know I think I love hitting too but it's just like fun to hype your team up and then you're also kind of killing the momentum of the other team because you just stuff their best hitter like I love blocking and then also like hitting too like the same thing just the practice and the reps and taking as much technical advice I think trying to be really coachable has been one of the things I worked on and like listening to my coaches and taking feedback and knowing that I can always get better and taking all that in because all I know is like they want the best for me and they're only going to tell me things to try to help me succeed. And that all cultivated in what I imagine one of the most exciting moments you ever had in high school, making it to the state tournaments and getting a bronze medal out of it. What do you recall from this past season and just how exciting it was to know that you were going to make your way into the state tournament? You know, the previous year, COVID ended the season prematurely. Uh, the prior two years, your bid ended in sections. So to get 
through that and make it into the final eight to play at the Axe, what do you remember from that section final and how that carried over into Excel Energy Center? Well, I remember the whole season we had the goal, like we were like, we're going to make it to state. Like that was our goal for the season. We were going to do whatever it took to be one of the top teams. And obviously we had one of the toughest sections, I think in the state, like Minnetonka, Chaska, Prior Lake, like we had some really tough teams to beat. So I think going in with that mentality, like we're going to win and we know we can do this, like believing in each other. So finally being able to accomplish that after saying that like from the beginning of the season was so exciting and we all just kind of like fell on the floor and we were so excited we were jumping up and down like it was like also like the year before during COVID like we also had a really strong team then and we were like we could have probably like made a good run and we were really bummed that it got cut so short so just knowing like going in with that fire of not having the season before and then also like just for ourselves, like it being our senior year, like we've never been to state, like this could be a great way to go out. And then that energy that carried through into state. Um, and then we made our run and we got third. It was just really exciting. And we all, I think just like played as a team and we played well together. And it's like a moment we'll remember out of our high school careers forever. What was your reaction when you saw all of those students run towards you at, after the section final to join you in the celebration? I did, all I could see was a sea of red and where I was on the Eden Prairie side, but it was no different on the Chaska side. But again, those two have a deep rivalry owing to being in the same section in just about every sport. But that has to be a cool experience and perhaps terrified because you have this sea of red and you have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, you've probably seen it all the time, storming the court after a big win in college and you got to live that at the high school level. And then everybody was hugging each other. I hadn't seen that kind of ecstasy in a long time. What was your take on it when everyone was joining you in this mob? Yeah, it was crazy. Everyone was rushing towards us. I actually had to like, at the end, I had to step out because I was like, I'm going to get run over. I'm trying to play at state next week. Like, I don't want to get hurt. But it was so fun. Like, I think a lot of our school was there. And then the parents were big advocates for us. They wanted as much as the school to be there. So I think they like paid for a lot of the students to get in. Um, so it was like so cool to see as many kids that wanted to come as possible. And even at school that day, a lot of kids were like, oh, we're coming to your game tonight. So it was so fun to like see them all actually show up and then everyone gets so excited, as excited as we were. And then, yeah, it was really exciting. I have never really experienced anything like it. So it was really fun. I found it amusing, Kendall, when you said you had to step away because like you're six <laughs> three and you've got a strong physical frame. I'm thinking <laughs> you probably could have held your own if anyone tried to mess with you. Yeah, I'm sure, but they're, they go crazy in those mosh pits. They, it's crazy. <laughs> But again, I'll never forget it. I think because of the way you want it. Uh, so <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't get to have some witty, fun sing, but hey, like it, it's when you see a mob like that, like I don't have to just let them tell the story and let them celebrate and just kind of take it all in as a broadcaster because I don't have a team per se. I don't root for anybody and, and I wouldn't want to because it wouldn't be fair to the viewers who are watching as I've built friendships all around. And as you look back on all of that, how do you think that symbolized your growth as an athlete where you've got a chance to play in the biggest stage, you've got to experience what winning a championship feels like. It was a section championship, but no matter what, you'll always have that experience in your story. Um, I think it was means a lot. Like, I said, like, even starting in the program and seeing how successful it's been. And then also just there, there were years of adversity. There was a year that our team wasn't as successful. So just getting to finally, like, see all the work that we put in. And our team is super, especially our senior class, like, super gritty, super always wanted to work. We always would do extra running and practice for fun to try to get better. Like, we were weird, but <laughs> we always, like, put in the work. And I think it like to see it finally all pay off for like our senior year and like to see all this progress like even from like JV B squad ninth grade like to see it all finally build up and us be successful and get the moment that we all had been dreaming of since like our seventh grade travel team it was really exciting 
and every sport has this, but in volleyball, what I find most fascinating for the athletes who excel in it, there's a lot of split second decision making, no matter the sport, especially in volleyball, basketball, football, when things can happen in a moment's notice. But for volleyball, it takes less than five seconds most of the time to run a set before you have to send it over. So communication, mobility, fluidity, your sets, all of that has to be on point because if you have even a slight slip up, it can mess up timing on the entire set. So how do you function with these series of quick time decisions when you're out there playing? Because everything happens really fast with the point in every play, you can get going rallies in a hurry, but even within that, you're putting plays together in less than five seconds. So that's not a lot of time to call things out. Yeah. Um, I think at this point it's kind of muscle memory, but it's obviously like a lot of communication. I think that's one thing, like a lot of coaches in volleyball in general, just stress, like you have to communicate, you have to talk, even though it's like, you're yelling things really fast. And even if you might yell the wrong thing, like it's so important to talk or even there's a lot of like before the play things that you talk about. So like me and Cam, our setter would talk about like what play we were going to run on that, like serve receive ball. And then like the backer would talk about like who was going to pass, like what ball. And then obviously like before the play, you like call the ball and say like mine, like I'm going to get that ball. Um, But also just like in between the play, like if you notice things or I feel like a lot of it's in between the plays too, that help a lot because if you're trying to call it all, like when it's right there, it's not very functional. But if you can talk about like what you're seeing and tendencies that the other team has, like, in between points it makes it a lot easier like during the play to know what's going on because like you said it is really fast and sometimes you're going to make the wrong play and the wrong read and you just have to live with that and keep going and i remembered what i was going to ask you a moment ago but your team this is one of the more interesting footnotes when it comes to volleyball eden prairie normally they play their home games in their small gymnasium with the rock climbing wall and i'm used to covering volleyball games at the competition gymnasium which volleyball and basketball both use and so when i was told that oh they play in the small gym like all right i'll head over there (laughs) but of course you had to move over to the big one for the section final How do you adapt to those environments or is that something that doesn't really come up when you're out there playing? But I just found it amusing because I think you're one of the few teams who had that dynamic where you play most of the time in the smaller gym, but you had to go big for that big playoff game that you hosted. Yeah, I think, well, our team loves playing in the small gym. Like we've definitely been given the option to play in the bigger gym for our normal games because I guess most people would be like why don't you play in this like really nice gym it's just like fun it's small it's like a home no one else uses it other than gymnastics and we're not in season at the same time as them so it's kind of like your second home you like decorate it cute and then Chad likes it because he can't see the parents he says he's like underneath the little ledge so you can't see any of the fans and if we look up we get yelled at because you can't interact with fans like pay attention to the game so it's kind of nice like you aren't distracted by anyone and it's, I feel like it's sometimes an advantage if there's a bunch of fans screaming in your face from above in this tiny little gym that the other team's not used to. But then in terms of playing in the big gym, like I feel like we've played in there enough and we practice, we practice in there. Like, so before sections, we always practice in there so that we're used to the environment and we get used to it. And then also like, since it's at home, our student section always helps us adapt. Um, and then with COVID last year, we had to play in there because it's like a bigger space and like social distancing and stuff. So a lot of us had played in there multiple times. So it wasn't that big of a, an adjustment, but it's just like the little, we like the small gym because of the little fun homey things. I just remember having to make some adjustments on my end too, because <laughs> it, it's pretty small from a broadcast setup. So I think I said mm-hmm. something, uh, this looks a little different, but it, it's just because we have to work with the space we were given. Yeah. Uh, but that was uh, that was an experience. Uh, Uh, to go all the way up top and I suppose it's easy to concentrate right you don't have to worry about I'm usually way up in the bleachers anyway so you probably couldn't hear what I'm saying Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, anyway so it probably worked out that way otherwise it might have psyched (laughs) you out it's like what is this guy going to say about us (laughs) 
Uh, but your impact at Eden Prairie and beyond is not limited to sports. As I learned about you uh, through our mutual friends, I understand you and Nia as your friendship grew, you know, both in the Dare to Be Real program, but the two of you also responsible for founding the Black Student Union at Eden Prairie. Uh, what led the two of you to launch that group and how do you think that has provided a space for men and women like yourself to have their voices heard? Yeah, so during COVID, me, Nia, and some of the people that graduated in 2021 seniors, we decided that we needed a safe space for Black students. Eden Prairie had had a Black student union in the past, but it kind of like had some division and then ended up like crumbling. So we decided like in the midst of George Floyd and all these other racial incidents that we needed a group where black students could come together and just be themselves and not have to worry about explaining themselves to people or having to say why they matter. Like it's just a space where you know you matter and you can talk, you can, if you want, we can have a conversation about race. If you don't want to, you just wanna play games, we can just do that. So we decided like that would be a great option. And I think it's been a fun space to just have community and have a sense of like solidarity almost among some of the black students at our school. And obviously like in the next few years, hopefully they can keep growing and putting more on more events. Like this year was kind of hard with COVID and the weird restrictions like off and on, but hopefully they can play more events and have more of an impact. And then also like staying that, maintaining that like community between all the students. What did you learn from that experience? Uh, because you and Nia were in Dare to Be Real, so you had some idea on how after school groups and participation work, but this one, a slightly different beast because you're starting this from the ground up. You mentioned there was a precedent, but it didn't sustain itself. So the two of you and some others got together and relaunched this group. What did you learn from that? Because I imagine it's different being a participant versus being someone who initially founded an organization. Yeah, um, I think it was just a cool leadership experience. I think I learned, you learned a lot about communication and there was a lot of like talking to admin and writing proposals and getting that approved or denied or how we had to edit that. So I think in terms of like leadership, it was really good to know how to communicate and how to effectively like write proposals and get rejected and like how to take feedback. I think for me individually, like it really helped my leadership skills and just like knowing that we can have a voice in our community and that these people are willing to listen to us. And like, obviously they're not always gonna say yes to everything you have to offer, but like if you have a solid idea and information to back you up and have a plan, like you're likely to, you can do a lot of things. And I think it was just good to, I got to work a lot. We worked a lot closer with like our administration and we got to know them a lot better. and just some of like the supporting staff in our school, I think it was a really good experience for that too. And I think some of that, I would, at least I would like to think some of what you learned carried over because you and I were talking, you were in St. Louis last weekend for this leadership conference where you were telling me they discuss a, a lot of similar issues to what you presented, what you brought up at, the Eden Prairie Black Student Union. Uh, if you don't mind, explain a little bit about this St. Louis trip. Yeah, so I went to St. Louis um, and it's called Teen Leadership Conference. It's a conference run through an organization called Jack and Jill, which is like a black, um, an organization for black families. And it's like predominantly through the mothers. And then they have like their meetings. And then the team, as you become a teen, you are in your own teen group. Um, so when you're younger, you're like go to activities and like have fun little workshops and it's educational. You learn about financial, other things. But then as you get become a teen, there's like a leadership. So each group has like a president, a vice president, um, like a secretary. So I'm not any of those leadership roles, but then there's also a regional conference every year. Um, so all the teens are invited. So this year I went and it was in St. Louis and it's basically there's like workshops and we got to learn more about just like being black and like being a powerful leader and how you can use your voice. And then also 
they had like a volunteer so we had like a volunteer day so we got to like volunteer and we did like hanging up clothes at this HBCU and we got to learn about the school and like how we can get back to our community so it's a lot of like um like leadership and then also like community service and how you can give back and use your voice like help your community and then also um and then it's also like fun so we had some like dances in there um they had like a senior presentation where we all got to walk in these like fancy dresses and the guys got to wear like suits and so that was nice um but yeah it's basically just like empowering black youth to know that they can be great in their communities and um give back to the communities but also like see themselves like in future leadership positions as well. How do you think all of these experiences as a volleyball athlete and what you're doing in positions of leadership through this uh, leadership conference in St. Louis, helping co-found the Black Student Union at Eden Prairie, I presume all of the initiatives, the causes you've taken up will carry over when you get to Bradley. So how do you think everything you've experienced as an athlete, as a citizen, as someone who advocates for people like yourself, how do you think that will help prepare you as you make the move to Bradley soon? Yeah, I think it's given me a lot of like foundational skills. I think I know how to advocate for myself and also like people that issues that I care about. Um, I think it's given me a lot of like communication skills and just ways to like handle adversity. Um, so hopefully in the future, I'm not exactly sure what I want to do, but I know I want to keep advocating for people and like making an impact in my community. So whether that be like a lawyer or like some sort of like activist, I don't know. I think um, at Bradley, like just exploring those opportunities. And then obviously like if I can find other clubs that are like similar to the clubs I'm in in high school, I think I'd love to be a part of that too, just to keep like using my voice and knowing I have a platform. And then also I feel like it's created a lot of relationships through that. So like I've met a lot of cool people and a lot of new friends. So hopefully that those similar shared passions can like lead me to some new cool people at Bradley too. I don't think you'll have a problem fitting in at Bradley <laughs> uh, with everything you're doing and it wouldn't surprise me if you and Nia, even though the two of you will be at different colleges uh, for now, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> presume what the next five minutes will bring, <laughs> considering everything we've dealt with the last couple of years. But I have I wouldn't be surprised if the two of you uh, continue your initiatives together, even though you won't be on the same campus. Uh, because uh, the two of you have been responsible for creating a spotlight, giving a voice to those who may not otherwise have it. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I agree. I think we have very similar like beliefs and values and we want to advocate for people that are like us or not like us even like, we just want everyone to have equal opportunities and to be able to live equal, happy lives. So if that ends up crossing paths in the future, maybe it will, if not, I'm sure we'll stay friends. So we'll see each other succeed and hopefully make an impact in the world. Of that, I have no doubt, although if uh, Nia gets any more blocks at Minnesota, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if it revives the debate over who taught who how to block. Remember, it was me. So. I, I, I could see it happen now this fall at Bradley and then this winter at Minnesota. I, I could see that <laughs> that dynamic going back and forth. It sounds like Nia will never admit to <laughs> learning from you, but uh, I digress. A few things I like to ask all of my guests on the podcast, again, to emphasize that you're much more than your record and your stat line suggests. Throughout your time as an athlete, it, volleyball or any other sport you took up, what would you say was the most exciting moment and the most embarrassing moment? Oh, gosh. Um... I think as an athlete, the most exciting moment was probably for high school, for sure, like going to state and getting third. And then for um, and then at club this year, my team got fifth in the highest division. And we like were ranked out of the I think it was 48 teams. We were ranked like 40th or something. And we ended up tying for fifth. So that was really exciting. 
because we weren't supposed to do anything and we played really well. Most embarrassing? <laughs> I don't really know. I always tell people like, this isn't really volleyball, but my eighth grade year at tryouts, I fell on my face twice because I was so nervous and stressed about like, we were like running and I like just fell. My legs just gave. That's probably the most embarrassing moment. But in terms of a game, there have been some balls that I've like hit to the back wall. Those are kind of, or like to the sidelines. I don't think I've ever hit anyone in the, oh, I broke this girl's foot freshman year. She like landed on me under the net. That was really embarrassing. Maybe that would be it. <laughs> I was going to say, did you hit the ball so hard that it's after a foot? Like what? Oh, okay. no, no, she, like, I was like under the net and she landed me. Yeah, I felt so bad. <laughs> oh, well, when you've got six women and one side and, and only so much space and that sometimes happens. Uh, you, you can only handle so many things at once, but uh, hopefully yeah. you haven't injured anyone else since then. No. <laughs> <laughs> and another question, and it actually comes from the breakdown book. I know they do one for volleyball. I get one for basketball. So you might've gotten a variation of this question, but I, I still find it fun because it's a fun way to pry some stories you might not otherwise know about the people you meet. Uh, what would you say is the most unusual thing about yourself that people wouldn't necessarily think about you if they met you for the first time? Oh gosh, I never know what to say for this question. I think in like breakdown, I say I'm from St. Louis, but you already touched on that. So, well, another fun fact is I was born in Ohio. Most people don't know that. Um, I think one is that I've never played basketball. People always like, are like, you've never played basketball ever. Like, I feel like from looking at me, you'd be like, yeah, she's for sure to play basketball. Never, never touched a ball on a court with the team. Oh, what might've been. <laughs> <laughs> well, in all seriousness, uh, Eden Prairie, they, they did just fine. I'm sure they, I'm sure they would have loved to had you there, but I think, you know, it worked out for you and, things worked out for their basketball program. And, yeah. And you, well, you're a living example of this. Not every tall woman has to play basketball. There are other activities and interests they can pursue. Yeah. So I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you've got that question multiple times. It wouldn't surprise me if you get a few more <laughs> at Bradley, uh, uh, but th that is kind of funny. I know we touched on it a little bit that yeah, you never played basketball and I'm just sure how many times you got asked to play or people will, meet you for the first time and see your six, three. And, uh, but, but there are other sports. There are, <laughs> there are other sports that I met. Like I, I've met a couple of folks who, you know, shot up in height, but you know, took up other interests outside of basketball. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not a one, you're not just a one trick pony, but I, I think you would have held your own, but again, yeah, you considering what you did in volleyball, I, I can't protest the results and the path you forged for yourself. Uh, and with everything you've experienced up to this point, learning about leadership through the conferences you've attended, the student groups you were a member of at Eden Prairie, and the success you had at volleyball, winning bronze as a senior, and turning from this kid who fell on her face into a division one athlete. What would you tell a younger version of yourself? I think just keep working hard and no matter the adversity that I would face or still will face, I guess, like to keep pushing and know that there are people out there that believe in you and everything will work out and you will get to play at a division one school and achieve some of your dreams. And we touched on this a little bit, but what are you most excited about as you head to Bradley and continue this journey? I have no idea how many wins you'll get, how many kills or blocks. That's not what I'm, you know, I'm not worried about those things. That's not why I do this, but knowing you're going to continue this journey for at least a few more years. I don't know what will happen after that. What excites you about this new chapter that's coming up? Um, I'm excited to compete and just like, like I said, like playing D1 has been a big goal of mine since I was little. So 
getting to play at that next level and getting to train. And then also I've met the team and they just seem like really great people. And so getting to be around a new group of people that's ready to compete and hopefully put Bradley on the map and be successful and win consecutive conference championships. Um, I'm really excited to see how that pans out. I guess you can put me in that camp too, although I do have one caveat. If for some reason you go up against Minnesota, things might get a little <laughs> awkward because I did graduate from there. So that might be the one instance where I might not be rooting for you as, as heavily. <laughs> <laughs> ITs, of course. And you know, even though you still have a lot to look forward to, what kind of legacy do you think you've established for future athletes who might follow you in volleyball or elsewhere or other leaders who take up the participation, the extracurricular activities you did with Dare to be Real Black Student Union, what kind of impact do you think you instilled? Eden Prairie is a large school, so it can be tough to stand out sometimes, uh, but you found a way to do it. How do you think that could resonate with the underclassmen who are following you as far as the classes go, and then even younger kids who aspire to one day do what you did? I think just having the work ethic and not ever taking anything for granted and also just constantly having like an underdog mentality and always pushing to see what you want, like knowing that your voice can be heard. And also in terms of like an athlete, I think being involved outside of athletics is really big and knowing that you can be successful in more areas than just a sport, because I feel like oh, there's a lot of athletes out there that like just do their sport and that's all they focus on. And for my parents, like they always told me like school's important, like be involved in your community because obviously like sports isn't gonna last forever no matter how long you want it to. So having other outlets and other ways you can make an impact, I think just knowing that if you have something that you're passionate about, that's not just your sport or if you're like only in other things like trying maybe a sport, um, you can be successful in multiple areas. You just have to have the work ethic and keep pushing because it's not easy, but if you have the drive and the passion for it, you can make it work. And I do have another inquiry because <laughs> I'm sure this has come up in all these conversations, but between you and Nia, if it was a one-on-one, -on -one, I don't know how it would work as far as what sport, but <laughs> who do you think would have the edge if the two of you were to ever face off? Because I don't think you were on track for one year, but outside of that, you, you played in separate sports. I know it's hard. I don't know. I'd like to think I'm a better one, but I, it'd just be hard. I feel like we're so, we're, we're very like different in terms of our like athletic abilities. Like she's like, I'd say like quicker and like smaller and I'm more like of a bigger physical presence, like blocker, you know? I think oh, if we were like doing a blocking contest, I'd for sure win. But if it was like, I don't know. I feel like we're just different. And I think that's one cool thing is like, we're very different, but also very similar. I would not argue against your blocking ability. <laughs> Although the two of you have, have demonstrated fluency in that area but but you're right because you, know, you you were a shot put in discus and track and Nia would do high jump and sprint races and set the school record in a high jump uh, so th that's why I said I think she would have fit right in it, yeah, with volleyball because of that vertical of hers she would have been perfect as a, as a blocking mate mm -hmm. would have been scary <laughs> <laughs> but you know maybe i don't know maybe the two of you will find something in common once uh, you're once you're done as college athletes maybe you'll find a way to settle this once and for all because i have a feeling the two of you would take that up just to have uh, another excuse for a little fun with each other but <laughs> you're right the two of you do bring vastly different skill sets to the field but it, it worked and i guess one perk about it is you were able to cheer for each other without having to worry about other commitments. So Nia was the student manager, so she could cheer you on in volleyball. And I'm sure uh, when the club season didn't overlap, you went to her basketball games. Uh, I don't recall if I saw you at 
her events, but I'm sure you were following and mm -hmm. it, it was a blessing to see the two of you and to learn about you, not just as athletes, but as citizens. And I'm ecstatic to see where that continues. I know I told Nia and told everyone after her graduation party, I said, you know, she's going to be a future leader. We're going to hear about her for a long time after basketball. And I would say the same to you, whatever happens at Bradley with everything that you've taken up, all the causes, all of the initiatives to be that voice, be that beacon for others. I have a sense we're going to be hearing about you as well. Thank you. <laughs> well, Candela, I know we were talking about this for a while and I'm still hopeful. Perhaps, you know what? I remember I brought up this idea with you and whenever the schedules align, I'd still love to get you and Nia for that quiz style podcast. <laughs> Maybe that's what would settle it. Because it's, So it's, <laughs> you know, who would win a one-on-one? -on -one? I feel that would be the best way to settle it between the two of you, because like you said, athletically, uh, not enough overlap to make it work outside of blocking. So I think that would be, that would be the true definition of Maybe. who the better friend or who the better athlete is. How would you handle a quiz on each other? <laughs> we'll, we'll make it happen at some point, but no, nah, it, it was a lot of fun. And I'm glad I had the opportunity to meet you and to see a glimpse of your volleyball acumen and your talent. I always say this, my only regret is not being able to cover you more often, but <laughs> I'm glad I got to see you when I did. Thank you for coming. And it was so great to meet you too. I'm glad that you got to cover the couple games this year and come to them. Well, Kendall Minta, thanks for coming on. And again, you will see her at Bradley University. The season starts around late August and we'll yeah. see it, how much she carries over her talents from Eden Prairie into the Braves uniform at Bradley, but I'm sure <laughs> she'll do well. And if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode of this podcast, just contact us at the Mike Peden on social media. All you need is a good story and we're happy to share it. So until next time, thanks for watching.